The communications network is carrying historic loads of traffic that multiply by the minute. A game-changing technology may be the silver bullet solution to the impending burden on the network. But what is unforeseen and what do we have to abandon to get it? We're still in the innovation and the early adoption cycle, and so we're still trying to figure out how to do this correctly and what are the best services. I think latency is going to be the biggest gotcha that people aren't prepared for. Cloud computing is changing the face and the culture of the communications industry and resolving issues that have plagued it for years. But questions and concerns are growing about how the cloud will benefit the industry and the ecosystem that relies on it. Cloud computing is not a magic bean, okay? It's not able to do everything and anything. We live in historic times, driven by innovation. But is technology providing real value? And how do we translate that value into our lives, our companies, our network? How do we stay connected without draining vital resources? Are we moving towards efficiency and sustainability? Or are we weakening the network? A connected world is what we strive for. It changes the world we live in every day, every minute, and sometimes every second. It's what makes our lives better. It's the future of the network. Starting a business around technology used to mean building hugely complex and expensive infrastructures to support your needs. If you wanted to build a social networking site with user-generated videos, you would have needed to invest in a massive amount of storage and computing hardware, along with acquiring huge bandwidth and networking resources. This meant data centers and staff and hundreds, maybe thousands of servers, all before you even knew if your idea would succeed. Today, with the cloud, you can acquire whatever portions of that monstrous infrastructure you need as you need them. Thus, building a fully capable infrastructure with little upfront cost, the ability to scale the whole system up or down, and the flexibility to change all of that by the second. The financial and technical barriers to entry in this new system are so low that almost anyone can launch a service that was previously only possible with enormous amounts of funding and technical know-how. Where the old way would take months or years to build, the cloud can build enterprise-grade systems in minutes. So, what is the cloud? The cloud is just a term to describe the shift from individual physical machines, such as data storage and computing resources, to virtual machines that have practically no limits to scale and scope. So, whether virtualizing simple data storage or computing resources, or virtualizing entire computing platforms and infrastructure, the cloud is a shift in technology and not a subtle one. All of the analyst reports that I see uh, are showing a dramatic increase in the utilization of cloud computing. So maybe you know five years ago it was 0.0001 percent. You know uh, a couple of years ago it was five percent. You know now we're pu we're pushing up on 10 percent all in. I would say that in the large businesses they're all using the cloud in some manner like the IRS or like the U.S. Census, every year they have a peak demand model. You have to buy for the peak and a little bit over that. But in a cloud model, you can just use it for when you need it and then turn it back in and it drops the cost back in. There are many reasons why the cloud has grown at this incredible pace over the last decade. One may be that consumers are opening the eyes of businesses to benefits of the cloud. In the consumer market, as consumers, who also are, are people who work in enterprises, become comfortable with using the cloud for their day-to-day -day life, they find out it's reliable, they feel safe and secure, and I think that's paved the way to, uh, you know, for the, the enterprises now to take a more serious look. I do think that we've seen consumers moving uh, to the cloud faster. And I think that it is a indication of their ability to take on risk. As an individual, it's much easier for me to take on risk. My um, investment in my technology is much less than a company. Companies invest millions of dollars in their technology and their speed to change is slower. So I think that they're just ahead on the growth curve. As the true benefits of the cloud are still not fully known, what is the current role of the cloud in enterprise? What we're seeing now is uh, large investments in technologies to automate the processes, automate the delivery of services, automate the orchestration of resources, automate the provisioning of applications. 
all the things that need to be done in a more efficient way to really get the benefits, the financial benefits of deploying cloud. So the question became, how do we get more performance out of what we already have? And we started looking at how uh, the servers were being used in the data center. Um, if you had a database application that was only utilizing 10% of the server's processing capabilities 90% of the time, well, maybe there was a way to utilize the rest of that capacity uh, for other things when you didn't need uh, all the database being used up. So that led to virtualization, where you could have multiple server instances running on the same piece of hardware uh, and allowed us to better utilize all the capacity that was already being installed into the data center. A good example of it is our telephone calling system. Uh, it used to be that we housed the servers here. Um, whenever we had to get a message out to, say, you know, all the 20,000 student households that are out there, um, the servers were here. We had multiple phone lines uh, out there. Well, now we just it's just all handled um, in the cloud through the internet. The company that handles that has a whole lot more lines than we ever would have had or been able to have. Um, so they can actually send out a message in just a few minutes, which might have taken us hours before. Cloud services from large-scale vendors are highly efficient and monetized. So why can't service providers utilize the cloud in the same way to generate new revenue streams? This is where the definition and use of the cloud gets, well, cloudy. A cloud designed for a service provider network is far more complex than a typical cloud infrastructure. So you think about cloud, you say, if I'm a service provider, either on a telecom side or a cloud data center service provider, I'm going to look at my network and say, geez, why can't I extract inc incremental value out of that network uh, that I can do traditionally on the server? So I think that's spawning a lot of the innovation and thinking behind things. In Amazon, we have applications running on top of the cloud. Let's just do the same in service providers. But actually, it's kind of different because the web clouds we know today are highly centralized. And in service providers, it has to be distributed. Why? Because the network is distributed. Today we have a hierarchical network with a core and metro and edge and uh, pops all the way in neighborhoods. That is because certain type of applications need to be in distributed places. So first off, it's about building a distributed cloud as opposed to a centralized one. Then how do you actually manage a cloud that's built of dozens or maybe in the future hundreds of locations? How do you optimize that? In the service provider space, it's all about delivering network services in a different, more efficient way. So the service providers really have to think through the entire chain. In 2013, analysts predict that cloud services will be a $130 billion market as cloud adoption surpasses cloud hype. So why has the enterprise just wet their feet with cloud computing in the last year or two? Classic IT environments have understood the infrastructure. They've largely controlled all of it. And the setup and provisioning and configuring of that net network infrastructure or provisioning of the assets in your server um, room or in your data center, they were under your control. You, you managed all of that for yourself. And it was pretty much a, a, a closed environment from that perspective. When you start to embrace cloud technologies, you release some of that control to others who are provisioning the service on your behalf. That, that's a cultural shift for organizations that have not had to do that in the past. It's really easy for me to sit here and say, hey, move all of your uh, internal data center equipment into a cloud environment that's 20 miles away. But then you start looking at the latency that it generates. Even if you have the fastest pipes in the universe, latency from point A to point B is always going to be a certain amount. The speed of light can only get so fast. And I think that's going to be a concern for certain apps. The things that are more critical to, to, the, to the enterprise are the, the slowest to being migrated to cloud. So you can see that the type of concerns that drive that are security, high availability, resilience. Uh, but at the end of the day, in many cases, it's more perception than reality. The company culture of chief information officers and IT managers is changing as enterprises outsource their data center networking to service providers. But as some welcome the cloud, others are more resistant. The cloud has traditionally been perceived to uh, be insecure. Um, people get very concerned when, uh, for two reasons. One, they don't know exactly what it is. The cloud, unfortunately, it's a great way of describing it, but it's a horrible way of describing it at the same time. Um, and that causes a lot of you know, discomfort when you know, IT managers, especially, who typically have their hands on their equipment, they no longer do that. Different levels within the organization have different uh, opinions about the right time and the right situation to move to the cloud. But essentially what we are doing with the cloud is we are insulating the CIO as well as the IT manager from the burden of having to build, manage, operate and run network infrastructure. We are allowing them to focus on their core competence. 
but uh, there may be certain staff within the IT organization that it doesn't fully correlate with that intent. So from time to time, um, I think we do have to sit down with the IT staff and explain to them the total cost of ownership, the revenue benefits, and the opportunity for the employee base to evolve their skill set from, from a legacy skill set to a progressive application-based skill set. And when, once that total picture emerges, most of the arguments are typically taken off the table. You know, what we see is the CIO and the CNO, network operator and information technology owner, are really starting to see a blending of their organizations as the classic internal IT network looks to the wide area network and tries to manage both of those assets as one. So some of the, you know, an example would be an organization that looks to the cloud as a burst capacity. For, for, for particular pe periods of time where they don't want to provision all the infrastructure for themselves or all of the capacity for themselves on an ongoing basis, but they like and need the ability to burst into some excess capacity provided by a cloud provider. Uh, that's a shift because it's a, a part of their infrastructure, part of their service offering is no longer directly under their control, it's provisioned by somebody else. So an understandable reluctance from a cultural perspective. So how did the cloud evolve? Just over a decade ago, dot-com retailers began building and refining their data centers to support the burgeoning online shopping market. This trend became one of the main factors that precipitated the accelerated growth of cloud technologies and services. At one point, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, data centers started reaching maximum capacity. And we started trying to find ways to better utilize what was already being installed. You couldn't put in more racks of gear without building whole new data centers or pulling in way more power and cooling than they were ever designed to handle. The last decade in particular has seen this explosion in the creation of digital data in science, in business, in, in, in consumer electronics, you name it. We're generating huge amounts of data, whether it's from observatories or whether it's from Twitter. In the early days of computing, really the, the whole revenue model was that, that because compute power was so exorbitantly expensive, and because the applications that were running against it were relatively, you know, batch oriented, it really it made sense that that one maybe one or two organizations maintained their compute systems, and then they parted it out as needed to kind of help them um, lower their costs. As the price of computing came down, we started seeing distributed models where the computers actually wound up in organizations' basements. So as that, that model changed over to more of a desktop server revolution, we really started seeing widely distributed models where all of the compute power was really, you know, basically if you had a business, you had a computer. Now that's sort of starting to change because if you graduate from one server to 10 or 100, the capabilities of trying to maintain that infrastructure started going up even for small businesses. Virtualization was a key driver for, for early days of cloud and deploying a virtual machine was a very lengthy and manually intensive process. It took up to six to eight weeks to go through all the steps of procuring the, the, the equipment, deploying, uh, uh, going through all the policy, the access uh, and security policies, all of that took a very long time. And what we are doing now, we are moving up the stack. We are moving to the uh, automation of application provisioning, where all the steps to provision and applications are starting to be automated. So the bar is being raised higher and higher. As the cloud evolves, industry is increasing its utilization of shared computing technologies. However, there is still a lot of ambiguity around how the cloud can support the enterprise and small and medium-sized businesses. A public cloud offers new functionality, such as nearly unlimited scale and greater efficiency and agility. A private cloud offers some of the advantages of a public cloud, with greater control, but requires more capital and operational investment. A hybrid cloud can offer aspects of a private and public cloud, but connecting and managing multiple networks can prove formidable. So it may make more sense for, especially the small, medium-sized businesses, even up into the enterprises, to move to more of a shared service model because they're getting the compute power they need. They're getting basically the generic sort of compute and familiar software that they're looking for and they previously maybe maintained inside. And they're also possibly able to access a pool of expert resources on top of that to manage some of those risks and help lower those risks. Private cloud is an environment where you are, as an entity that wants to run cloud services, building the entire cloud yourself. Now, it could be building a cloud 
from the ground up in your own data center to do run all of your services in a cloud environment, gets all the efficiencies of the use of the hardware, the power consumption, uh, the high uptime that cloud could provide if you're using the right services and capabilities. And there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, but you can also build that infrastructure in other people's data centers. We can have a private cloud hosted by another company in their data center. The great thing about cloud is that you can also do a mixture between on-premise and off-premise so that you could put some data in the cloud and some data on-premise depending on what your security risk and concerns are about the data that you have there. You can do multi-tenant where your data is shared on the same server but virtualized or you could even have it be separate tenant where you're on your own server completely separate and that's nearly the same as if you're in your own data center. The public uh, cloud infrastructure performance uh, by performance, I mean uh, connectivity, availability, elasticity, as well as latency, will start to mirror that of a engineered private network on-prem. And when that truly starts to happen, there'll be no need for a telecom closet on-prem. That's the evolution that is occurring. That's the evolution I'm keenly watching, because if that truly happens and materializes, we can relabel data centers in five years' time as multimedia communication hub. Security in the cloud is paramount for organizations of all sizes. However, security also introduces one of the biggest barriers to entry for the cloud as trust continues to be a concern. Privacy issues, breaches of managed service provider networks, and misinformation about cloud security slow the adoption of the cloud. But most people have a tendency when they build private cloud, since they can see them, they exist in the data center, they're on their resources and on their hardware, uh, not to put a lot of forethought and thinking in terms of how security is going to be implemented around those applications and information systems that are there. When they move into the public cloud, they're very paranoid, and therefore they spend a lot of time on federated identity management solutions, they spend a lot of time on encryption, spend a lot of time on dealing with, uh, with security in flight, information moving into the cloud, and security at rest, in information that exists in the cloud. And therefore what I'm seeing is, is uh, kind of a strange thing. I'm seeing that in many instances, public cloud-based systems, based applications, based databases are more secure than their private cloud counterparts because the amount of work and technology that went into it because of the concern of security and privacy. When you buy a cloud a service from the right provider, they have been able to take that service and put it on hardware and do penetration testing and do the right kind of infrastructure build out that will make it be much more secure than you could invest in your point solutions on their own. James Staten at Gardner you know, said it's going to be you know, uh, many, many billions of dollars that are lost in terms of cloud computing revenue that was not gotten because of the PRISM scandal and things like that. But as we're l moving into these systems and we see this kind of infighting between commercial organizations such as the cloud providers and the government, Normal enterprises who can benefit from cloud computing, such as the small to medium-sized businesses, are just apt to say, I'm not doing it now. I'll wait for all this stuff to really kind of settle in because uh, it looks very scary, it looks very confusing, and I don't have time to follow it, and so I'm just going to leave it alone. So that's costing innovation. Those are costing dollars, not only to the cloud providers, but also money that can be saved in terms of agility and cost efficiencies in some of these organizations out there. As public cloud providers have more resources to offer a wider scope of security services, enterprises are leveraging security as a service offerings for operations like disaster recovery. What we are seeing with cloud, actually cloud provides a phenomenal opportunity to offer disaster recovery as a service because now you only need one primary data center built uh, for, for a specific customer and then you can use the backup data center as a shared resource among many different customers. So that it's one of the ways that cloud provide an incredible efficiency in resource utilization. In many instances, if you're leveraging systems in the public cloud, they've done a tremendous jo uh, job at setting those things up for business continuity and disaster recovery kinds of scenarios. So they have those things implemented within their networks. So just by hosting the systems and hosting the data, hosting your information systems in the cloud, they have the capability to recover from certain disasters. Availability zones, the ability to fail over to additional geographically dispersed data centers are all built into their network. And so in many instances, you don't need to think about disaster recovery. It's built into the cloud provider that you're leveraging. Despite the efficiencies gained by the cloud, enterprises are still seeing skyrocketing costs, both capital and operational, in their data centers. 
Virtual networking is proving to be a big opportunity for service providers as cloud storage and compute offer ways to cut costs and federate your business with more than one provider. The really interesting thing has been that, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, your data center wasn't the dominant cost of your enterprise. Now it is. The data center costs, our data center costs more than the rest of our building. And within the data center, the power infrastructure costs more than the building that the power infrastructure is in, which in turn costs more than the land it's on. So the equation is such that your power infrastructure is your greatest capital expense if you're going to build a data center that needs megawatts of power. When you really look at the total cost of ownership argument, when you're in the cloud, you don't have multiple lines of capital in your budget. You don't have to have multiple nagging lines of maintenance for every piece of software or hardware you buy. You don't have to routinely, every two to three years, plan for new technology introduction, nor do you have to worry about and guard yourself against technology obsolescence every three to five years. So the ability to really broker uh, these, these services so that enterprises can optimize the way they source their services is what's going to drive uh, cloud next. So on the supply side for cloud service providers, what that means is, first of all, offering uh, a portfolio of services that they can, they can broker, but also the ability to federate, federate among service providers so they can have more capacity available, they can offer a broader range of services, and all in all, they can, they can serve a broader range of needs for, for enterprises. Some of the challenges that inhibit the adoption of cloud services are more perception than reality. But there are real-world barriers to entry that are clear, and some that are not. I believe latency is probably the most common misconception that people have, how important that is to the quality of the performance of their data. When people get used to being able to do a query in like their email account and get an answer immediately, and then they get in a situation where they do a query and every time they click a button they might have to wait half a second before their system can respond, that starts becoming an issue for certain people. It can become very annoying and, and irritating. It becomes more important when you're using huge data sets, like when you're doing business intelligence or you're doing customer resource management. You can start questioning how valuable is it to have to wait for updates to occur just to do simple questions and queries. And then you say, okay, well, then I'll move the data I need down out of the cloud when I'm working on it and move it back into the cloud when I'm not working on it. Well, if you're doing a lot of creative work, that could become very time consuming and difficult if you're trying to get to uh, new decisions that you need to make in your strategy or on how you're going to reach out to your customers for a marketing campaign or something like that. And I think latency is going to be the biggest gotcha that people aren't prepared for. Legacy networks are just that, they, they are legacy, which means it's very hard to get new service out of a legacy network. And the only way perhaps you can attempt that is to layer one network on top of the other, and, and ultimately what you're left with is infrastructure as well as people's competence, skills, that is only specific to that technology. The cloud cannot survive without a sturdy and robust backbone network. The massive bandwidth demands on the network from new services and the cloud demonstrate a nearly insurmountable obstacle for operators. Until a recent invention called software-defined networking, or SDN. SDN technologies are still largely unknown, but demand for the cloud is driving the industry to take notice. I think if you look at some of the bottlenecks that exist within enterprise IT and cloud today, those networking assets and the flexibility in those networks are, are a bottleneck in, in existing technologies, and I'm speaking specifically of SDN. The network is a truly integral part of delivering on the promise of cloud computing. Um, if you look at the requirements of um, cloud computing, the requirements are performance, reliability, scalability, security, um, control, and visibility. And if you look at the data center networks of today, they are far from delivering on those attributes. In fact, they are single tenanted data centers that are rather rigid, complex, and have very cumbersome provisioning models. In other words, they're simply not set up to deliver cloud services. And they are in the way. The data center networks are in the way. If you consider the the growth and development of the infrastructure, particularly, and how, based on the technologies that have occurred up until now, a lot of the legacy technologies on which it's been based, one of the challenges has been one of scale, the ability to, to match capacity with the demand, which has become extremely you know, challenged, challenging of late.
It's really the opportunity to unleash the power of the network and to make it more agile and more software controlled. How we do that is by really separating the different parts um, of the, the networking device. And so you know, traditionally a networking device has the forwarding plane that pushes packets from A to B. It has the control plane that really manages what the, what the device does. It has um, the, the services plane which governs the services that, that, are the device, uh, that run on the device. And then finally the management plane which allows kind of an external entity to manage it. And historically those have been all wrapped up in a single uh, form factor which is a single device. And what we're trying to do is really separate those, tease those functions out to allow us to really more optimally um, place those in the network and, and to give more agility to the network operator. What SDN provides is the promise of a centralized management and control and provisioning of those resources, which is transformational in the, in, in, and a game changer. What we know is cloud computing spurred a revolution in the information communications industry. So the question is not whether the cloud will be a part of your company culture, but more how you will utilize it which type of cloud applies to your business model, and how you will secure your information. I believe that over the next five years, everyone is going to look at the cloud first when they start looking at rolling out new services and new capabilities. Any moment where there's an opportunity to upgrade or to change or you're forced to replace equipment because of it's being phased out or it's past its service life, I think it makes sense for people to be evaluating whether or not the cloud plays a role. And I believe more and more people are going to start accepting that the cloud is the right logical solution to be moving into. The big question is, um, are people going to be uncomfortable moving into a public cloud, or are they going to want to stick with the private cloud, or are they going to try to find some magical hybrid between the two? I hope in five years you'll see a lot more liquid-based cooling, because while it may take, let's say, one unit of power to run a certain number of servers, it requires 30 to 50 percent of that power to then cool those servers that you just ran. And so you really want to develop more effective cooling techniques to, produce, to reduce that waste power uh, effectively, um, as well as reduce that unit required to run them to maybe half of that. I think we're at this pretty amazing inflection point in networking now that technology is enabling and uh, has you know, created capability that, that allows this level of, of change to occur. So I think the, the future is very bright. If the primary goal of the cloud is to provide economies of scale through shared resources and converged infrastructures, then the industry will inherently follow suit. But what will the future hold for the cloud as some legacy infrastructures and business practices fall behind innovation? Stay tuned for part five of the Future of the Network documentary on the value chain, titled Squeezing Value from the Chain. Also stay tuned for Spectrum, Waves of the Future, coming soon to TIANow.org.